Okay. Have you a view there, Pete? Oh, maybe I have it here. Just that. Um, oh, yeah, that's good. All right. That's great. Well, greetings, everyone. Um, real privilege to be here. Um, I'm speaking from a place in County Wicklow, which is called the Garden of Ireland. <laughs> um, I'm in a friend's house. We live in Dublin, outside of Dublin, but we were down here for a meeting today. And we stayed over to the evening here. And it's just fantastic to be here. Well done, Peter and Sharon, for organizing all this. Some faces I know, I know well, and others are new, new friends, new brothers and sisters. So wonderful to be here. Um, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, obviously, um, I, I know some of you and how you've journeyed on so well and so faithfully with the Lord over the over the decades. Um, if you have your Bible with you, I'd like to read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 and 13. Uh, that'll be our, our basis for what I felt on my heart to share with you tonight. I want this to be a word of encouragement mm. and a word that will um, just um, help us through uh, very strange times where we are going through both um, as nations, as communities, but also as the church um, of God. I believe they're wonderful times, they're times of great blessing, but they're also times of trial. And when, where the spirit of the Lord is working, there is always, um, there is temptation. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says, therefore, and we'll have a look a little bit what the therefore is, but let him or her who thinks he stands or holds up, take heed, catch yourself, take hold of yourself, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, except such as is common to man. But God, don't we love the but gods? He's faithful personally to you tonight this morning he is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it what fantastic verse the provision of a way out a provision of a way escape Marvin Vincent, when he was writing his um, uh, uh, words study of the New Testament, he actually said that this word, um, the, way, um, the way of escape, uh, the proper Greek word, slightly later Greek word, is the landing place. Mm. I don't know about you, I like, I like that picture of a landing place. It's firm, it's, it's a place. I can remember, I was just thinking this afternoon of the landing place. And uh, years and years ago, probably back around the 80s, the mid 80s, I had a friend and his brother had a small plane and my friend was a pilot and he flew me to England once. And I thought this was great excitement, except halfway over the Irish Sea, the electrics went. And he was very gracious. He didn't panic, but he said inside I was panicking. We managed to get down the landing gear uh, manually but we had to find a landing place, uh, like an airport, an airstrip, and they would know what was wrong with us. And the way he indicated was he, with his wings, he tilted the wings and he flew over. And first airport, they didn't respond, a small airport, maybe they didn't know, maybe he thought it was a crazy Irish man, uh, flying and straight. We went to another one and, and, uh, and had the third one, a car drove out and up the runway, and that was the sign, we had a landing place. And brother, was I glad to be to get my feet on the ground to find a landing place in time of panic, in time of need. Another time we used to go fishing off the west coast of Ireland and we had a little boat. And for some reason, I forget the reason, I was out with my boys and we ran low of petrol. And, and, and whatever way the tide was, the current was moving the boat quite fast down and out into the Atlantic. I knew we had to find find a landing place, but all the rocks, all the coast was full of rocks. 
we were about two, 300 meters from the coast, but we couldn't go in because of, because of the rocks. And then I saw it out of the corner of my eye. I saw our landing place, it was a small cove with sand and I revved up the engine and we just made it in on time. Of course, the, the boys thought it was fantastic fun. I just was wondering, what will I tell their mother? Uh, but anyway, we made it. Landing place. It's wonderful to have a landing place in life. And Paul says that in time of temptation, don't think that we're not vulnerable. Don't think that we won't succumb to this. But we do. I was with a uh, privilege. Ruth and I was with uh, a couple last week. And uh, they're brothers and sisters, many years in the faith. And uh, the dear husband, he's he told me, I'm dying, and by the look of him, I, I'd say he is. He's well on, he's over 80, ready to go home. And, and it just, it, it, was, it, was a, it, was just, it was a wonderful time. We sang, we prayed, we, uh, 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 we shared with one another, and, and something lifted in him. And, and he talked about a place in God that he said, when you need this sort of grace, it's there. And so as we imagine, what would I be like if I got this news? How would I react? Well, you see, God is faithful. He will supply that landing place that we need. But I was struck by something that um, the lady, she said to me, and it wasn't, we talked much scripture, much spiritual things, but this wasn't necessarily a spiritual thing she said. She said, life is the art of getting used to what you didn't expect. Hmm. I said, that's so true. She said, I didn't expect this. I didn't expect I'd end up having to be a nurse and, 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 and a carer and all this. And, and somehow it's like that. And I'm sure by now, you know that sometimes the brook dries up uh, like Elijah found. Sometimes God's providences work through loss, through even material insecurities, through maybe unexpected events. And even sometimes through apparent failure. But as we read that story about Elijah, you know, the drying up of the brook of, of Cherith's supply and blessing, actually, it was worth it. It was worth the drying up, even the bit of anxiety that it brought to Elijah because the Lord led him to another landing place, to Zarephath, where among other things, there was clarification uh, and he came to a deeper experience and a deeper realization that his hope, his help, his resource was in God who made heaven and earth. And he learned something that enabled him to move on. So praise the Lord for this landing place that we have in him, the way of escape. And, and that's what caught my eye, especially at this times of pressure and temptation and sometimes when we think of temptation we think oh i'm dabbling in sin no no where we we are tempted even tempted to take our foot off the spiritual accelerator a little tempted to retain a certain attitude that we know the spirit is saying i want to you to put to death with this there's always temptation and and this section that we that we've just read this whole chapter 10 it's a culmination of a section of Paul's epistle that began probably back around chapter eight, the context which is written to those who, who were not novices. They, they had a degree of maturity, of strength, of understanding and experience in the things of God. And in chapter 10, he brings this cautionary note as to the reality of the subtle adversarial realm in which we live, which much of it is intent to tempt you from what it says in chapter nine, running the race, running the race, pressing on, going through. And so Paul says here, he's giving advice. The Holy Spirit is giving us advice. He says, don't be unaware, verse one. Take heed, verse 10. And then he also mentions, I think it's twice here. He says, there are certain things. These things, he said, are recorded. And he uses an interesting word in verse six, recorded for our examples. And this word, uh, I mean, I'm, I love my, my uh, uh, um, Strong's and my Vincent's, and it's all on, on um, 
it's on my phone now and you go instantly to it. In the old days, you had to go through these thousand page and look it up. It comes immediately. And I just, I looked up that word examples because it seems, uh, um, this is important. There are examples here when we're tempted, when there's pressure on us, when unexpected things are coming in that we didn't expect. There are examples for us to take note of. So I just looked in on that word example. For us, it's, it's, to me, it isn't such a strong word. I mean, I used to say to the kid, I mean, you know, so-and-so is a good example, but, but it didn't really always register with them. So I looked up the word and in the Greek, it means impression. So the same word is used when, when Thomas said, I, unless I see his, his hand and the print of the nail print uh, of the nails on his hand, that word print is, is the same word, for example, the impression. And then Stephen, when he was quoting about Moses making the tabernacle in the wilderness, he said, it, it's according to the pattern. That's also an example. So we have impression and pattern. And somewhere else in Rome, it's a cause about, it's the same word. He says, it's a standard, that which, uh, uh, that form, that standard of doctrine, I think it is. So straight away here, the Holy Spirit, he's chosen this word for generations and generations. And here we are here today. And we want to, what's this example? Well, it's almost as if he's saying, please don't be ignorant or unaware of this example, which I want to impress on you. I want to form a pattern in you, how you react in trouble, in temptation, and to raise a standard in your thinking. For in this is the way of escape. This is the way of victory and freedom through very strange times and unusual times. And they're written here are things that we can learn from some of the events in the journeys of the children of Israel. They're sometimes referred to the church of God in the wilderness and their failure under the most promising of circumstances. It's a very sad story. And as you read through, just for the sake of time, I didn't read from 1 uh, to 13, but just I pick out, there's, there's a verse 6, and, and it talks about these are some of the core issues where we, where we can be tempted on um, subtly. And it doesn't matter how spiritual we are, how many years we've walked with the Lord, some of us here, maybe over 50 years, we've walked with him, we've known his companionship. We failed, we've succeeded, we've had mixtures, we've had ups and downs. But he says here in verse six, now these things became our example to the intent that we should not lust or long for after evil things as they also lust. The first thing is that what do we crave for? What do we crave for? What do we long for? What's that, what's that real appetite within us? And then the second thing is in the next verse when he talks about idolatry, who do we worship? Those are the two key things. Those are the two pillars. We have, Lord, I, I keep me by your grace, longing after you in everything, in practical things, and all those horizontal things, but also in that vertical walk that I have with you. Keep me long. Keep me worshiping you. Hallelujah. Now, the events here, because I want to keep it in the context of the scripture, the events referred to here in chapter 10 relate to those that are described back in, in Exodus, in Deuteronomy, in numbers. And I just thought, let's just zoom in on a few of these events where they were really tempted. This is the church of God in the wilderness. They've just been blessed. They've just experienced uh, freedom, uh, uh, um, the, the revelation of the Lord in their lives, and, and, and certain things happen to them where they were tempted. And then we're going to see, in view of those things, which nothing's new under the earth, the same sort of temptations come Maybe the prevailing circumstances and conditions are different, but the same types of spirits come, the same types of tendency in the human heart come. And we can, we're going to end on a positive note and see what's the landing place here, Paul? What's, what are you showing us that when we're tempted in these certain ways? And can I say probably to most of us here, there isn't really anything new under the sun. If you've read the scripture, we know these things, but oh, how often, at least I am anyway, I need to be reminded again and again because it's amazing with everything that's happening in our mind. Oh, Lord, thank you for reminding me of those things. So I, I just pray and trust the Lord will, will, will use this simple message to just encourage our heart, to strengthen our hearts in these days. 
So um, if we if we turn back to um, to Numbers chapter 10, we'll probably be in the book of Numbers and then back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So if we go to Numbers um, chapter 10, okay, I just want to point out something before we come into this, uh, uh, if you like, the temptation. And I just want to read as they were heading out, okay, Numbers 10, 33. They departed from the mountain of the Lord on a journey of three days. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them. For a three days journey to search out a resting place for them. How kind the Lord is. He went before them. I'm going to find your resting place. And the cloud of the Lord was above them. So they'd something before them. They'd something above them. And now as new covenant people, we also have that same presence within us. <laughs> so before, above, and now within us. Hallelujah. And the cloud of the Lord was above them by day when they went out from the camp. And of course, there was the fire at night to give them warmth and to give them comfort and also to guide them. And so they're about to do this. And this temptation comes and and at first you know it, it it may seem inconsequential and you may not even say and you can easily say to me well larry that wasn't really a temptation well i i feel it is right just just a niggle um it's it's a small thing but how often have you we've heard if you counsel people how often have you heard people say it only began with something small you know, it could have been a look, an attitude, uh, a discretion, an indiscretion. We talked about in the Bible, we, we read about little foxes, small rudder or tongue, small things. Be aware of small things. And here's a small thing. I'm calling it a small hesitancy, a small hesitancy. You see, um, there's a tendency and a weakness of the human heart. At times, we profess to trust God, but we look towards the experts in their field to help us in a certain thing. And we sometimes find it easier to rely on just a mortal who has experience in this area, one whom we can see, talk to, rather than Jehovah who we can't see. Of course, we can, we can talk to him. But we like to have a bit of a, a safety net. Now, please take there is there is wisdom in heading counsel with others. Of course, there is. And we do consult people and we do share and submit to one another. But as I show you this, I think you'll understand what I mean. So verse verse 29. Now, Moses said to this man, Hobab, he was, I think, his cousin. He was the son of Jethro, his his father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. And then he said, come with us. We we'll treat you well. For the Lord has promised the good things to Israel. And Hobart said, I won't go, but I will depart to my own land and to my relatives. But he did help him. And it wasn't a disaster. And in fact, Hobart, his he he. He had an inheritance in Canaan. And, uh, uh, but the very fact that Moses, we already seen he had this cloud above, the covenant before, he didn't really need the guidance to this place. He didn't need uh, um, a man of, of who really wasn't committed. He wasn't a committed man. Um, he, he had an alternative vision. And sometimes, we're inclined to go even to the world for certain advice. Now, I had a, I had a medical uh, condition at the beginning of the year, and I went to the medical world to get advice and, and a consultant, and hallelujah. And I thank the Lord for her and, and the knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So keep this in balance. But we will know where the Lord has spoken to you and confirmed it to you, and you're on the way. And you said, well, maybe I'll just... You know, I'll get a bit of counseling here from even though someone they don't even know the Lord, but I will will do it. So it was just just a small 
niggle. It's best to wait until you're fully sure. So the, that's one of the first things I read about that as they start off. And then the next thing, of course, is a more uh, uh, bigger thing. Uh, we all we know about it. It's in uh, this chapter and also chapter 14 of Numbers. Maybe we just turn over to chapter 14 and you know what it is, I'm sure. And I'm sure it's something that none of you do on screen. It's only the, the three Irish of us. We're great at this, murmuring and complaining. <laughs> I joke, it's, it's a condition of all the human hearts. But it was only after three days, and they're already complaining. Even though the Lord had sought out for them a campsite, their comfort had been provided for, Canaan was just ahead. And they carry in their heart this promise of victory. And they should be singing the songs of rejoicing. They should have had Bob and Margie with them singing. But murmuring comes up. And murmuring never makes the way easier. And in this day and age, and I'm sure it's the same in every country, wherever you are, there's a disproportionate sense of entitlement today, particularly in the Western world. And, and, and if, it, if we don't, get it we murmur and complain and here you can trace the beginning of a downward spiral and we've all seen it in in, in our own lives and in the lives of the church a little leaven of complaining can have an awful effect on subsequent progress and we'll see why we need the way of escape shortly for this i came across a little quote from a victorian book right so this is slightly sort of tongue-in-cheek okay and I, I, I don't know how to do a good Victorian sort of English accent, but here we go. How often we look upon grumbling as a little sin. And not until we try to check ourselves in it do we find out how complete is its possession of us. And how it is ready to spring upon us under the slightest provocation. The weather is bad. The tea is too sweet. The dinner is half cold. The maid is unpunctual. The post is late. I just thought that summed up me a picture of Victorian England. And there they get it. And, and, and no matter how perfect life was, the complain. Watch out for complain. I'm still watching that. Uh, uh, we've had things maybe in the last six months. I, I could complain all. I could murmur about. And the Lord has really been convicting me of this. He said, don't. I'm looking after you. There's a great little book. I just throw it out there. If you can manage uh, 17th century English, which isn't always easy, there's a little book by a man called Jeremiah Burroughs. And it's a, it, it's, a, it's a thin book. And he wrote this, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. And it, oh, wow. Oh, in one sense, I didn't want to read it. But the more I read, I said, Lord, Lord, purge this out in me. And, and, and now I'm slightly more aware of, of the need for a landing place when these things come up. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, we can have a go at something and it, it doesn't affect us, but that deep, constant murmuring and criticizing and complaining. Third thing, and we read it back in chapter 11, verse 4, it talks about the mixed multitude. So the third problem, the third temptation we can have uh, um, we mix, we mix with strangers. These were strangers. They had followed them out of Egypt. Some people say maybe uh, uh, um, their, their father was Egyptian, their mother was Hebrew, their, uh, their mix. They, uh, they had a little knowledge of Jehovah. They just came out. They wanted to get out from under the dictatorship of Pharaoh. And they came out and there were many who came out and many who were blessed, but there was also those. They craved after the, the delicacies of Egypt. They were mixed. And sometimes over familiarity with those who've never known God's regeneration grace can quickly pull us down to their uh, level. And here there was con contagion because the rest of the, the people of God, they joined in. And, and, and we want to eat meat too. That's what they wanted. We want meat. You know, having murmured at the way in which God led them, they're now murmuring now at the food God fed them. Uh, my experience that of sometimes being involved in churches and maybe talking with pastors or I travel around a bit, Africa, India, 
China, et cetera. It's the same the world over. The, these two issues are in the forefront of, I would say, of most, most troubles in churches. You can probably think of one that it isn't. But it's how we are led and how we are fed. Something comes in like this. And they mix this in. And yet God had given them this miracle bread from heaven, which we'll see in a moment because that's part of the landing place. It was perfect for their diet, for their uh, probably 10-day journey, which was intended. It ended up 38 years. But when our spiritual life, affected by maybe hesitancy, by murmurings, is low, we kind of tar of angels' food. We tar and our hearts inclined to turn back to the world we have left. You know, it's interesting that during the time um, that when the word of God was having a real reforming effect in the time in the days of Nehemiah. It said when they heard the word, it said they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. Now, God forbid that we become the exclusive brothers or the exclusive church. We welcome and we have to. This church set on a hill attracting all the weird and the wonderful. And we could all tell stories about all the weird and the wonderful, particularly in the last three years that have, well, of course, not with COVID, but pre-COVID and post-COVID that come in. And we welcome them, but we stay very separated onto God in our hearts. And the word we preach and share is still separated onto him. But that doesn't mean we don't despise them. But beware of the mixture. Now, we could go on, there's a few more. I just point out one more of these temptations. And I think uh, if you've never experienced this, well, why don't you, will you go and enjoy yourself to some, have a meal or something? But I think we've all experienced this and it comes and it's a temptation. And we read about this also in Numbers, Numbers 11. It's even this great man, Moses, See, the complaining was infectious. And it says in verse 14, he says this, and he was a great man, a strong man, mighty man. Think of what he faced up Pharaoh. Um, he said, I am not able to bear all these people. The burden is too heavy for me. That, that, that discouragement. In itself, it's not temptation, but it can lead to temptation very quickly. Oh, these people I just want to give up and again this you can trace it as you read through Exodus Deuteronomy numbers is this downward spiral unbelief sense of failure discouragement despising criticism doubting God rebellion comes idolatry and they these were some of the temptations so help us Lord we need we need a landing place we need a landing path we need a way of escape. And um, so let's go back to 1 Corinthians 10. Those are just a few things. And you will have your own things. They could be in the area of financial pressure, health situations, relationships. Maybe it's some of our ages. It's, it's, it's children or grandchildren. Um, the, we've been ambushed by disappointments. And it's, it's like what my friend said, Life is the art of getting used to what you didn't expect. And we're tempted. We're tempted ever so slightly. We don't say that meetings ever so slightly to doubt God, to wonder, does he hear me? What have I done? And all sorts of things we can get tempted on. And so here he says there's a place of escape. So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. What do we find here? Well, I want to keep within the context of the chapter. And the symbolism of this chapter. And the first thing I find that just spoke to me is here in verse three. He calls about spiritual food. Spiritual food. Be, be, I'll just get my place here. Be aware, be conscious that there is daily spiritual food for you and I. And it is a landing price. Of course, it represents the word of God. Now, on Thursday, I was I had the privilege to go up to a, a Christian rehabilitation center. Some of you may have heard of Teen Challenge. And there's a wonderful 
place in the Wicklow Hills where it's been there. My friend, he runs it. He's fantastic. He's had favor. Even the president of our country, he opens things for them. He opens doors for them. Some of the judges have come on and have. It's just a real miracle. I have the privilege to, to go in for their chapel uh, at uh, half nine. Once a week, I go there. And uh, you can you can quickly see the guys who don't want to be there, but they have to be there because they've signed in as part of the course and those who do want to be there. And I really felt I wanted to 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 wake them up. But anyway, I, I, I just I, I was beginning to talk to them about the word of God and I could see some of them were puzzled. What's the word of God? And you all know, but let me just refresh it. It's 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 the word of God is a person. It's a person. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. Logos. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. We know this. But, and, and, and he's, he's witnessed to by his book here and the book there, the Bible. The Bible is the word of God, the written word of God. It's, it's on paper or nowadays it's probably on tablet or something. It used to be on parchment. And it's, it's, it's incredible. And, and the more... This this is a this witnesses to the living word, the person of Jesus. And this is primarily why I read the scripture and obviously why you read it. But it's just good to refresh ourselves. Because one of the temptations is to sort of say, oh, I know this Bible off by heart. I've heard so many meetings. You don't know the Bible off by heart. No one knows it off by heart in that sense, because it's an incredible book. Of course, it's the most. Uh, Purchase the book every year. It's the most read book every year. And by the way, it's the most burnt book in history. And someone told me during the summer, it's the most shoplifted book. <laughs> uh, and I, my mind boggles. How do they know? But, but And do the people who steal it, read it, and then they have to bring it back again? Is it the most returned book? I don't know. But anyway, this word, it's, it's, it's God's device through which we may see and experience in person the living word. And then thirdly, I said to these men, I said, the word of God can actually come to you today through this old man it's speaking to you. I, I, it's Peter calls about he he talks about let those who speak speak the very words of God. I mean, I never presume that. Uh, I'm just sharing an if you like an impression and a sense of my spirit that this is God. But sometimes framed within something you hear in a church or a song or a line or or, or a piece of history, God can speak. And that's the spoken word, the preached word. So there's the person. And then what witnesses to the person is this wonderful word of God. And do you know, we got to pick it every day. We got to pick it up every day. Um, the effects in the wilderness and the fears it produced. I'm just having a look at my time here. We're OK for a few more moments. It, it, it got to them and they began to complain and regret they'd ever left Egypt. And God said, OK, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Food from the sky. Fantastic. They called it. They call the bread glory. They said in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord. And as we, in the morning, my daily devotions and my discipline of reading the scripture. Lord, I don't want it to be. I want it to see your glory. In it. And it just has changed my mind. A little. It's a landing place. I don't. It doesn't always. Sort of, oh, there's the glory of the Lord. But actually, it's, I'm becoming to experience something a little bit more real and a little bit more, if you like, revelatory. Since I, 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 I just be more diligent to gather. He said in verse, um, this is the next, part, but he just said, gather more. Some gathered more and some gathered less. And this is wonderful. He said, he who gathered little had no lack. Hallelujah. Maybe you're busy. Maybe you have time. Maybe you have only a certain capacity. The, the, the main thing is you gather some. It's called angel food. Um, he opened the heavens. He rained down manna for them to eat. And it says he satisfied them with bread from heaven. And then on the sixth day, and you know this, they collected it sufficient for two days. And there was none on the seventh. And something about he, he times his word to us. 
And often when it's when you're not searching, oh, the next sermon or or the next uh, uh, I have to go here or go there. It, it, it's as you love him and love his word and land there and the glory begins to come. And uh, it, it's taken on a slightly different dimension to me, his word. It came every day to them and then it disappeared when it wasn't gathered. And, you know, how, how do we treat his daily supply of his word? Uh, I, I'm at the age now that you're beginning to forget things. So I began to journal a bit more. I don't want to ignore it. I want to take it home and grind it and put it in my oven and wait for it to rise, take it out and eat it more and ask God for creative ways for you to explore. He has a book for you maybe to read this, uh, this autumn, this fall, or, or, or something that uh, someone to listen to that will open up some part of his scripture to you. Um, we have to appropriate it. That, yeah, the manna came, but they had to go out and pick it. They had to exercise themselves, bend down, pick it, bring it home. And, and, and they didn't know what it was. And sometimes we don't know. We don't read. We, what, what's it on about? They, they called it manna, which means what is this? It was something out of this world. And Lord, raise our, our, uh, our you know, familiarity can breed contempt. And we get so familiar. Oh, I know where that verse is. At. Yeah, but do you know what it is? Is it feeding you now? It's, it, is it a real landing place to come in time of temptation? And it's a wonderful thing. We read in Hebrews that when, when, um, when manna, when it ended, they didn't need it anymore. Uh, uh, they were heading into the promised land that they, they gathered a bit of it and they put it in a pot and, and, uh, and they put this manna bread in a pot in the tabernacle. And can I say this to you? And you know this, but his bread is still in his tabernacle. His tabernacle is Jesus, preserved forever for us to go into him and obtain more. You know, he calls himself the bread of life. This is, this is our landing place. It's not just to teach us what he is in relation to the needs of our soul. Yes, it is that, but actually it's to remind us that he must be inwardly fed upon, the bar absorbed, taken in, eaten, made part of our very selves. So this is how he can impart strength, joy in our hearts, even in times of trouble and temptation. And uh, the manna, the hidden manna reference in, um, in uh, where is it? In Romans, uh, sorry, in Revelation chapter two, of course that speaks of the Lord Jesus. He's hidden, he's withdrawn from sight, but he's ever present through the spirit. And it speaks of our life is hid with him in God. He gives the manna in giving himself. Now we're going to quickly move on. Just there was another, there were other things, and uh, I can we can talk on, but I just want to come to one particular thing at the end. There was, of course, the cloud, and you can read all these. All I think there are five alls in this. Um, but there's there's the cloud, um, that wonderful, it's a figure, it's it, it, it's it's a symbol of his covering, guiding, God brooding over his people. And you know what? That that sort of sense it gives us the enjoyment of his presence it's not just oh uh, guide me lord where where will i go on holiday who will i witness to that no it's a sense of his presence they took comfort in that this cloud it came and of course it gave them a, a shelter and moisture when things were hot and dry so these are landing points these are these are ways of escape for us in the context of this portion of scripture I was tempted to speak on the uh, on the 12 points of the serpent of brass, you know, the 12 points of the cross. This is wonderful, uh, but it's really a whole talk and in itself. But do you remember in Numbers 21, they'd been they they, they had sinned uh, um, and they God sent serpents to bite them with poison. Some died and Moses interceded and then God told him to 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 put that serpent raised up jesus refers to this in john chapter three just as moses raised up that serpent in the wilderness so i'll be raised up it, it, it speaks of the cross and you know do you get condemned do you get sometimes a sense of guilt sometimes we deserve it but a lot of the time it's just something whispering in us oh you're hopeless oh you failed again oh what sort of 
mother had you? Or what, had, what, what did you imbibe before you were in Christian? It's amazing these things, maybe three in the morning when you wake up. And we need, we need to know his, his deliverance, the cross, these that. And, and then in that picture of the brass, if there are 12 points about the cross, it's, it's one. Yeah, and you probably know them. That's a wonderful landing point. Paul said at the, at the beginning, he said, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing or who are losing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God in temptation. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Well, not the wood, not the piece of, but the person who hung at it. And that, what it represents, the efficacy, the power, the strength that flows, forgiveness. There is no condemnation. If you're sitting under a cloud tonight and, uh, uh, and something has, oh, I remember that. I never dealt with that. I blew that. And I should have said, the, oh, come on, Lord, I'm coming to you. Yeah, he may tell you to go and do something right. But sometimes it's, it's just a, a condemnation thing. And we need that because sometimes the churches and church leaders and people in churches, particularly if they're being effective in evangelism, if they're being effective in their worship of, of Jehovah, they will be, something will come in and, and, and criticize. Anyway, um, it also speaks of the rock. Uh, we know that is, is Jesus. Can I say this? Don't strike it out of frustration. You know, like, Get a move on, God, you're, you're a bit late. And, 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 and that can take even the more on. We can get quite even blasphemous. But, but just speak to him. Whisper his name. The rock. The last one I wanted to talk to, and there's a few more of these things that they experienced. Um, now, it isn't in this uh, section of Corinthians, but it, it is in the time that they were about to enter the land. And it was this the cities of refuge these are wonderful and i was just thinking about this the other day this was a real literally a landing place for people who had blown it either probably accidentally maybe had even murdered someone um and sometimes they, I mean, they're, they're just, just, they had been misunderstood um, and people's attitudes came after them and they need, it was a temptation. I've known people who have left churches and they're innocent, but things have just been said about them. Things have happened to them. They've misconstrued them and they have had no place to go on their loss. I love the fact that actually, God has provided cities of refuge, and it could be maybe your home. It could be hospitality. It could be just an arm to get around, not to condemn, not even to correct, although we can correct, but just to love them, to take them in. The amount of people over the years I've heard all, I, I went and stayed with so-and-so for a month, for a year. I lived with them, and it was like healing in my heart. These are like cities of refuge. When people are tempted to capitulate under the pressure of guilt there are these cities of it and you can read about them in um in numbers 35 but but an interesting thing that isn't in the scripture i hope you don't mind me talking about something that isn't in the scripture but it actually says there were special roads built or maybe if this is but i want to say say something about the talmud there were special roads built to the cities of refuge to ease and hasten the escape for their perpetrator and the Talmud states that in accordance with the requirements of specially built roads to the cities of refuge, the roads to these cities they were to be signposted refuge way out escape route landing place oh I'm so appreciative of some brothers a bit older than me maybe who over the years have provided a a place of refuge for me in their hearts, in their concern, in their encouragement, and being able to speak into my life. It also said that these roads were, were twice the, the regulation width. It, it's in the Talmud. And they were particularly smooth and even in order that fugitives were unhindered as possible. 
you know, I, I, I've got this imagination. I just see these. This is a smooth way in, a wide way in, this landing place. We can know his rescue. We can know his, his love, his, his ointment, his word, his honey tonight, whatever you need. Um, I'm just going to end now, and I want to quote Psalm 27, not the whole Psalm. Um, this was, this is a Psalm that was, um, you know, Asaph was passing through a deep trial when he wrote this Psalm. And in verse 7, 8, and 9, he's some questions and all the answers are no. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Now, I know we probably don't verbalize this, but some of we think it. Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? No, 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 no. And then he goes down, but I will remember the works of the Lord. Some of these things we've talked about tonight, I will remember what he's done. I will remember there is a landing place for me personally right now, a place of escape that I can come out of these things, heal my heart, heal my mind. And then he says, in verse 19, he says, your way was, the, was in the sea. I thought that's very, when I, I read that your way was in the sea. In other words, it's, it's sometimes where we don't expect to be. The landing place for you, for that temptation that will come your way, or maybe you've just come through something. It, 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 it may be something that's new. It, it may be something that you haven't really thought about before. Um, and the way of the sea, you know, to navigate at sea, you have to look up. The water leaves no trace. And he says, your way is in the sea. And I realize, yes, Lord, you look up. The landing place is around us, is about us. So, brothers and sisters, with the temptation, he will also make the way of escape that you will be able to bear it. And I believe you will come into place, you'll be able to bear it with joy, supernatural joy. Hallelujah. That's what I had in my heart to share with you. I just pray and I'll pass back to Peter. It's been a great joy to be with you. Father, we thank you for this invention of Zoom. Uh, you, you knew we'd need this at some stage. And thank you, the church has flourished and grown even over pandemic when every the governments were trying to shut us down we had this and we thank you that we can meet together in this way and we bless you for your body your church on the earth and the many lands here that are represented churches represented communities represented and i pray lord that increasingly even though sometimes outside things are getting dark strange sin abounds your grace is abounding and you've supplied this place for us it's a it's it's an eternal place you've always had it in your heart and that's why when we read this two thousand years ago paul wrote this it's as relevant to us today and i thank you pray you'll bless any today who are listening who are who are, are going through trauma or stress Maybe some coming out of a sort of depressive thing. Lord, will you even tonight before heads hit the pillow, come and bring your, your beautiful relief and joy and a sense of your presence and healing to us. We ask you, oh, Lord, how we need you. And continue to bless each of us here, wherever we are, our families, churches, where we work where we live. Lord, bring your glory. Spread your glory on the earth, we pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We can pray this in your mighty name. Amen.